I am back. Let us begin. Who's got a question? I have a question. Go for it, man. Um, when you're painting, uh, what's your thought process like? It's a good question. I don't think about anything. Oh. All right, next. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the the reason why this is true is because um, let me let me let me put it to you in, in a way that you would really understand right away. Um, when you're walking, do you think about walking? I do not. Why not? Because I'm so used to it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, as we were growing up, we've been kind of, you know, been told that like painting and drawing is this type of thing that like, it's like a talent, right? It's like a skill that only the special can obtain, right? Mm. Now, there are obvious cases for, for people who are a little bit more, you know, advanced, you understand like people that have a better understanding or advantage in some things, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for instance, Kobe Bryant is a very popular American basketball player. He's very tall, right? Mm. So that's going to give him an advantage over me when it comes to playing basketball, right? Would you agree? Yeah. But is that why he's better at basketball? No. No. So what is it that makes him better? Like, he why is he better than me at basketball? He probably practiced a lot. Yeah, a lot. He's the first one in, last one out type of thing, right? And and that's that's the part that people need to focus in on, right? So anyways, getting to my point is that, like, you know, because people think of, of uh, art like this, they think of it very much like I just talked about, right? Hmm. Um, they tend to, uh, they tend to do this thing where they, when they see someone draw or paint, they, they almost ultimately think that there must be some sort of thought process. There must be some sort of like freaking Da Vinci code mentality going on in their brain. And they never, almost never think of it as the way that I just described it as just like muscle memory, like me being able to design is just straight muscle memory. It's a bizarre concept, isn't it? Right? Like that, what I'm doing right now, like what I'm drawing, I'm not even thinking about at all. Uh, the proof of this is because I'm talking to you. I'm thinking about your question and I'm trying to answer that. That is what's on my cognitive mind right now. Like on the front of my mind is answering your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then how, how is this possible, you think? Well, it's just like everything else. Like, how is it possible that when you walk, you don't think about it? And it's because you've been doing it for so long that your brain, and I think I was talking to you guys about this before, right? Your brain is really good at doing things without you knowing, hmm. right? And basically what I'm doing right here is another example of this thing. You understand? Hmm. Right, so how did I get here? Well, just like walking, I did it, you know, a lot. When I was a kid, when I was a little toddler, I can tell you right now, I was not very good at walking. And I and I am almost positive I can make that same prediction about most of you, if not all of you, right? Hmm. That at one point in your guys' lives, you guys were not very good at walking. But now you guys are all walking, at least as far as I know. I don't know, maybe some of you guys don't know how to walk still, which is fine. You still understand my point, mm. right? And so whenever I paint, um, the real things that are actually going through my mind is usually something that's not going to help you, okay? At mm. this point, at this point in time, okay? Well, eventually, but not right now, right? Mm. Uh, what it is on my mind is what am I painting? That's what's on my mind. Mm. Like the actual subject that is this going to be good? Like, are people going to like this? You know, that's what's going through my mind. Am I thinking about the design? Like the actual, like physical, like the shapes? No, that's all subconscious. Am I thinking about like how to paint it? Well, no, that's all subconscious. 
just like when you're running and catching a ball, what's on your mind usually is trying to catch that ball. Not about the running or jumping or any of that, like just the, on the very surface. You see kind of the point I'm making here? Mm -hmm. All right. And so that, like, that's why I always say you should like study. You know, I've talked about it several times already, right, with many different mm -hmm. students in different ways. But this is why, right? Like the reason why is because I want it to be muscle memory. I want to not think about stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I just always want to just be on the front of my mind and just always rolling uh, aggressively, you know? Like, at like with like a high capacity mm. and that's really hard to do I understand you know mm. it's really hard to do I get it but that's why we have to practice because even with walking it took you forever to get good at walking it took you probably a year maybe two to become pretty pro walker <laughs> you know mm. And so uh, what are the things that you can do? Well, one of the things that I like to do is like I talked about before is like I try to do something until I understand it. You know, mm. watch, let's, let's pop up some, let's pop up some, uh, I don't know when to go to unity. It's been a while since I've been in unity. Nah, never mind. I'll, I'll just keep painting. <laughs> I um, like when I'm trying to move a, a, a like when I learn program I try to do stuff where it's just like can I move a cube hmm. you know and I just try to remember like how do I move a cube you know what I mean mm -hmm. and just the, basics. just the basics and then I just keep doing it until like I feel really comfortable with it uh, with programming, programming is one of those things that has become very clear to me. To be a good programmer is to um, know how to program, like to basically solve problems, you know? Mm. Where being a good concept artist, it's about same, it's kind of like the same idea, like about solving problems, but it's a little bit different, okay? Because the problems that you have to solve are a lot more creative. So the, the way to be a good character concept artist is to, to understand the target audience, right? Mm. And the scope in which you should work within, like the means that you have access to. And people for, tend to forget this. You know, they, they love to find... Oh, I, I heard this somewhere. I love that. use it almost everywhere now. It's like people try to find... Uh, good news for their bad habits. Mm. So remember I was talking about how sometimes people will find like really sketch concept artists, like concept mm. artists who sketch more than paint. And then they say, oh yeah, see this person. Like, so they found someone who satisfy <laughs> this, this simpler solution to a larger problem that they have mm. instead of ultimately just facing their larger problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so for me it's like the opposite like i see a problem and it can be really simple and i want to solve it on a very macro level mm. you know and and there, there needs to be a, a a place where i have to like you know set my stakes and like plant, plant my flag you know what i mean mm. uh, because you know for instance like with programming i can go all the way down to like the actual freaking processor of my computer it's a little mm. too much right mm. but you, you get my point like i try to really understand the same thing with the painting you can do the same thing with art like you can go really down like down like a really large rabbit hole so for me it really comes down to like i don't need to have like a medical anatomy understanding mm. i don't need to be like the kind of designer that is going to be talked about in legendary tales of, in books. It's not important. Mm. What's important to me is that I have a fundamental understanding and do I feel like I have control? You know, mm. if I feel like I have control, then I feel really good.
And so what you should do is start to practice these things. Like for instance, uh, anatomy, uh, perspective, you should practice um, understanding form and lighting, colors, values, even more so than colors. These are like the things that you should understand on like a painting level. And then uh, when it comes to design, you should understand shapes. You should understand the ideas. You know, you should understand popular opinion versus like niche opinion. Hmm. These types of things. And then when it comes to game time, like the, these things aren't always on the top of your mind. You just think about them subconsciously. And you just solve the problems without even thinking. You just say, oh, you know, this, this design doesn't have enough of a thing. Like, it's not cool enough, so how can I make it cool? Like, you don't say, how can I make it cool? You just say, oh, it's not cool enough. So then you just, your brain will just say, oh, it's not cool enough? Okay, well, we already know what to do. And we'll just start going, and you move on. This is why, like, you've probably met artists who are really impressive painters who can't teach you what they do. Mm -hmm. they have a hard time explaining it or you just don't understand what they've explained right i'm sure you've met this these types mm -hmm. of people before it's not to say anything bad about them it's just how it is the reason why this happens and probably why it's shocking that it happens in the first place is because you don't understand it like how can you not know what you're doing <laughs> you know mm -hmm. uh, but after me explaining what i just explained you could probably understand now and have a lot more sympathy for why this happens mm -hmm. right yeah. It's because they they weren't thinking about it. They just figured it out. Just like if you had to try to explain how to walk, it would be really funny. Right? Even though you do it every day. Yeah. Right? And so, like, there's a really good test that I heard that people will let programmers do, which is like, or not programmers, um, game testers, is, is like have them describe how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Like, that would be the test. Like, describe to me how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. And depending on how you write that, uh, will determine how observant you are, hmm. right? If you just say something like, okay, yeah, you know, you just get peanut butter and you put it on the bread and then you get some jelly put on the bread and then you just put it together. And then, and then the person who is a good reviewer will say, well, what, which comes first? And he's like, do you get the peanut butter first or should you get the bread first? And he's like, well, it doesn't matter. I was like, well, why doesn't it matter? And I was like, oh, well, because you can just put the bread out first and then the peanut butter. And then you, once you've had the peanut butter, well, so I guess like you should have the bread ready and then, and then you should uh, put the peanut butter on there. Okay, so do I use my hand or do I just pour it on there? I was like, oh, no, you should use like a butter knife. Oh, why not a steak knife? And you see what I'm saying? Like... Mm -hmm. Like you start to say, oh yeah, there's like a lot to it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even though it's really simple, it's a really mm. simple concept, but like uh, a lot of people don't realize that now. So take something like that same concept of like, like really having a hard time understanding how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Once you actually think about it, like it isn't that complicated to do actually. Right. But mm. to explain it to somebody else, like that knows nothing about anything, right. They don't know what a butter knife is. They don't know what bread is. They don't know anything. Like how do you instruct someone? right hmm. now take something as simple as that and see how like that it, that can become really complicated right and then apply that same kind of idea but now it's like painting where there is like so many different facets you know hmm. so yeah like this person who's really good at painting may not be able to explain it not only because like they've never thought about it before but also it's really complicated you know, there is a lot of things to consider, you know? Mm. And so, and so that, like, like I said, like, that's why you should put a lot of attention, a lot of energy into learning larger fundamental skills. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Does that help? Yeah. I think you understand. Yeah, so so to kind of like have you have a takeaway um, from that question, like I don't really think about anything and because mostly because I spend a lot of my time 
um, doing stuff. And the way that I got to this position was basically studying a lot of stuff, like understanding materials, perspective, lighting, all this stuff. So just pick one thing at a time. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Just pick one thing at a time. Don't try to do like a million different things. That's usually where people mess up. Hmm. Cool beans. Uh, I have a question. Go for it. Um, if, uh, like, uh, how how do industry pipelines work? Is this something that can be, like, uh, something that uh, you could maybe explain on, yeah, or you, just depends on the company? No, there, there's there's some like core uh pipelines that you can i can tell you about um but yes of course depends on the company right many different companies work many different ways that's right uh but that that's a good question because there is there is something that you can learn so um one of the things you should uh first understand is that like where as a concept artist where do we live we live in the very front lines usually okay we are in pre-production because it's much cheaper to say, tell me to draw like a shark with laser eyes and then me to draw it and for us to not like it than it is to, for me to say to somebody, hey, let's make a, a shark with laser eyes, animate it, put it into the game and put some inputs on it so we can move around and then finding out that it's not good, mm. right? It's cheaper to find out through art, concept art, than it is through actual implementation okay so that's what we do so that's like that's what our job it really is it's our basically the blueprints right like we're we're trying to create the schematics of what the plan's going to be and and it saves a lot of time almost always right yeah okay so so then what is the um so then what is the next thing so we so essentially that's where we are. So let's, let's kind of start from the beginning. So the very beginning of the pipeline would be um, just the idea. Like you'll have like a, a person in a room, a guy or a gal or a series of people. And they're just like, I have this idea. Okay. Basically you're this, it's a shark MMO RPG open world game. You play as a shark, you can get like new fins and cool scars and tidbits and abilities to make you a better shark. Cool. Let's do it, right? And so then the next step is you usually write. So you create like game docs. You create, you know, mission statements, etc. You understand? You just you start developing the thingy, okay? And then uh, then you start to build the team, and then that's when you get like the writers, the game designers, and then the concept artists, okay? Now uh, game studios are starting to kind of avoid using concept artists because they think it's a costly effect, specifically like indie studios. But um, this is only in the past. People are starting to realize the value of like having the ability to concept, right? Uh, how much time, like there's a reason why like larger studios use this, use us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's actually more opportunities now, slowly uh, coming out of indie studios because indie studios also are making good amounts of money off of their games. Um, not a lot of them. Uh, if you were to look at the numbers, the majority of them aren't making good, good amounts of money. But then again, the majority of indie games aren't very good, right? So it's, it could be a... There you go. Um, it could be a, just a, a, a factor of, you know, I mean, it could just be a matter of like, that's, remember how I was showing you, like people are looking at the information wrong? Yeah. It's not a matter of like indie developers aren't making money. It's just there's not that many are just doing really well. And and if you look at why, most likely it's because their games aren't very good. You know? Yeah. And so anyway, um, so then the next step is usually production. So you have concept art, develop a lot of concept story, uh, the narrative team or whatever, if you have one. Like again, like 
it all depends on the studio. Usually the smaller the studio, the more people wear different hats, right? But the larger the studio, you can have specialized people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then you go into production, so you get the 3D artists involved, you know? And animators and technical artists, you start building tools if you need tools, so on and so forth, right? Like this is the time to start to, to actually develop it. And so like something like this, like the, this for instance could be a concept, so I can design this and then, you know, pass this over to a modeler, the modeler tries to make it, right? Yeah. Uh, I usually do orthographics and all that stuff. And then the animator will take a very basic model that the modeler would take. Like usually the model modeler will make like a box version. They call it the proxy model, like the box version of this character you see in front of you, right? It's just like a very simple character, you know? <clears throat> right? Like super simple. Yep. And and then start animating it as they wait for like the final version, right? They'll start animating boxes essentially. Um, so they don't wait around. And then once that happens, then you have somebody who eventually gives them the final model, the animator puts on there and then they make this, the secondary changes, the tertiary changes, they basically try to get the final animation ready to go, you know? And then you put it into the game and, and you just keep doing that with like environment stuff, with uh, character stuff, props, all sorts of things of all sorts of kinds until you have yourself something that a consumer puts in their hands. Now, depending on where and what studio you work for, if it's animation then it's not a game, then it's like a animation. So then the pipeline works a little bit different, but essentially this is similar. And same thing with movies. Uh, depending on the context of the the film too, like if it's a uh, not a movie but a TV show, then the the pipeline's a lot faster. If it's an advertisement, it is like fucking on crack. It's like everything was needed to be done yesterday. Like when I work on film, it's like literally like days of work, like two days. You know, I work. I'm sorry, like not film. Finished project. Uh, not, not film for advertisements. Uh, for films, it's like months, like a few months. And for games, it's like a year, years even. Because just by the product of the nature, or the nature of the product, I mean. So for instance, like a, a, a advertisement's only gonna be like 30 seconds. Or a, a music video is only gonna be like a couple minutes, right? So there's no need to have like a lot of work done. Uh, film is, <laughs> is closer to two hours, right? So there's probably gonna be a lot of work to be done, you know? Yeah. And then a video game is countless hours. And not only that, like, um, people can go wherever, usually, right? Especially if it's like a 3D game. So then you really, you really have to like design things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so keep all that in mind. Like that's pretty much the pipelines, but what is the most relevant to you is usually that we live in pre-production and in production. Um, very, very unlikely that we work in post. Post-production is like the thing is pretty much done. Because if there's like concept at the end, like that, that means you really had a bad, <laughs> you did a bad I guess job that's in the beginning. More like illustration work. Yeah, illustrations and, and posts because that's marketing and stuff, right? Like they're trying to market the game or whatever. Um, but it's also production. Like illustration is also production stuff. It's not pre-production. Because usually an illustrator will have some concept given to them, you know, and they have to make the illustration. And because the illustration is the final product. Yeah. You know, where a concept isn't. It's just the idea of what the final product is going to be or could be. That's the difference, you know? And so, so yeah, um, I was going to say one more thing, but yeah, ultimately what ends up happening after that is after like production usually like, or at least towards the end of production for a concept artist is usually we would have to then do, um, we would basically and essentially 
uh, move on to the next project, if there's a next project, and begin concepting and designing that. So it's like the end of that job. Yeah, like we, we move on to the next big thing and then start developing visuals for that. You know? Cool. Yeah, making things is very hard. So it takes a lot of effort. Uh, but what we do, the service that we provide is very valuable. So, so always remember that. We can save ultimately a company a lots of money. If you think of it like this, like um, if it costs like a million to $2 million to make like one second of animation in a film, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry, one minute of film, you know, um, then paying an artist like me to make sure that the 10 or 15 minutes of that film, right? Look like this, like as they can plan out, right? They have like a plan around it of like for 10 to 15 minutes of footage. Like I said, like with a million to $2 million of pops, so you're looking at 15 to $30 million, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm designing like a character that's going to be seen in those 10 to 15 minutes. It's cheaper to pay someone like me for a few months to do something like that at like, like 10 to 15 to 20, even $30,000, right? For like a few months worth. It's, it's so much cheaper, you know? Because then we know what we're going to do, right? We save money. You get it? Mm -hmm. But if we don't know and we make a mistake and we have to do, redo the, the 10 minutes, because the designs of the characters just didn't look good because we didn't predict it. Because we didn't have anything to use to help us predict that, right? Um, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna hurt. In video games, there's less of this kind of like real um, fear of like really effing things up because video games, people give a lot more um, leniency because it's interactive and sometimes as long as it's fun, right? then you know, the visuals can really be kind of garbage, right? Yeah. So it's not nearly as, as uh, valuable, but like a film, a film needs to have a lot of things in going right. You can't have a film that is filmed very poorly, that has a great story, that those are very rare, okay? Uh, and But you can definitely have a really kind of basic, really simple story in a movie, right? Yep. And amazing visuals, and it will do fine. You know, like the Fast and Furious franchise. Like, it's, it's very, it's more likely that a film that has a very simple plot line, but amazing visuals will do much better than like a, a uh, indie film about like donuts or something really <laughs> arbitrary, you know, but it has like a really meaningful narrative, but it's like filmed on like a smartphone, you know, like you, you just, it's not going to work out as well. If you have like, unless you have like really high production value and good aesthetic eyes. That's why story bar artists are pretty valuable. That's why concept artists are pretty valuable, saves time and money. So hopefully that helps you out, give you a better understanding of like the pipeline and where we yeah. stand in our value. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Cool beans. Any other questions? Yeah, so if you look at this character, like this character is super bizarre, right? But this will do really well like on places like ArtStation, maybe even on DeviantArt. Because those audiences, especially on ArtStation, are other artists, you know? But like the mass public like, generally are not going to be like drooling over this. Uh, in fact, the only reason why people would be impressed with this outside of our, our communities is just by the quality of the image if I keep painting it and do a really good job. That's like the great equalizer. One thing that I've been doing for quite a long time now 
uh, on my Instagram is like, I'll tell jokes about my artwork. I kind of make fun of them. And that's very relatable. The art memes. Yeah, I kind of try to make them into art memes, yeah. Like I take like a weakness that I see in the artwork or something that seems really funny about it. Like, so for instance, like with your characters that always look to the left or something, or they always like never turn their body. I would make a joke about that, you know? I wouldn't make the change. I'll just put it, leave it in and just joke about it. Any other questions? Mm, I have a question. Go for it. I'm gonna uh, drink some smoothie. Is there a difference for uh, when doing concept art for games versus when doing it for films, or is it the same? Yeah, I'll answer that in just a second. Let me uh, drink more smoothie. Hungry. So the biggest difference. It's just the speed and also the quality. So, you know, I usually tell people to try to really uh, be really good painters and paint well or do really effective paintings because it's so much easier and so much more clear, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so much more clear. Um, to do something like that because then it's easier to step down than it is to step up. For for instance, like if you were to just do sketches, it's easier to do sketches than it is to just render really nice. So you want to have like the, the ladder skill, right? Because you mm. can step back. You can always just paint loosely if you wanted to, you know? Mm. And the way that I think about this too is like think of it like Usain Bolt is one of the fastest runners on this planet, you know? Mm. So it's kind of like imagine... Usain Bolt uh, doing like a light jog, like his light jog would probably outmatch our strongest sprints, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say a jog, like maybe if he just ran, but he wasn't sprinting. Like he, mm -hmm. it would be like whenever you race children, you know what I mean? Like you're, you know, you're kind of running, but like super easy to beat them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not, you're like only at 60%. So that's what I'm saying. Like, so if you have like a really good skill in painting and then you sketch, you see what I'm getting at? Like your sketches mm. will be a lot more impressive. You know, mm. you'll feel very much the same as the example I just gave. But, um, but like I say that because like, then it makes you a lot more prepared for different types of jobs. So for instance, the idea of being able to um, concept for films, right? You, you need to actually be pretty realistic because a lot of people who are looking at your work, like the directors and stuff, they're not artists, like the way that we're artists. So they don't, they can't see between the lines, right? Mm. You know, and so you have to like basically not only draw between the lines, right? You have to also put them right on the front page so they can see it clearly and understand. So this is why you see a lot of people use photo bashing in film, uh, a lot of 3D in film, you know, mm. for these reasons. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This this is why this is why people do the thing the things that they do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but like it's because you just gotta like have like you know how asking you guys to do like three or four characters and you give you guys a couple of days to do it. In film, like you have the day to do it. You know, mm. and they have to not be thumbnails. They have to be like fully rendered in color. So you can see why 3D or uh, uh, not just 3D, but like um, well, photo bashing is really attractive then. Uh, whenever I worked in film, I would always use 3D and, and photo bashing because, because of the reason I just told you, right? Mm. So yeah, that's, that's one of the main reasons. But uh, for games, they usually have a lot more time. 
and and like I said earlier, they're a lot more lenient, you know, mm. because a lot of visuals can be forgiven, ultimately. Unless that's like the whole appeal of your game, like if you're making like Last of Us, like that's like the whole idea is that it like looks real, you know. Mm. Then then it's different stakes, but even then, like they still have more time. But uh, most likely, you would have to use photo bashing or 3D to kind of keep it the demands. Um, but I work really well in games because I paint, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty, pretty realistic, or at least pretty clear. You know, and I go pretty quick, paint mm -hmm. very quickly. And so, like in games, I work really well because you know a lot of game developers tend to want to push more niche aesthetics because the game industry is a little bit more open to it like you see games like halo and destiny and these types of like sci-fi genres or like bioshock or uh, new cyberpunk like these games do better like these kinds of genres do better in games because the people who tend to play these games there's a lot of us you know um but in movies like th there's less people that show up to the movies like someone who plays halo might not go watch the Halo movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like that. This is why they, they rarely make Halo movies. Like, there's a lot of people who play the Assassin's Creed game, but nobody went and saw the movie. Same with the War Warcraft movie. I thought that was going to be like a huge thing in America. I was wrong. It did really bad in America. Nobody went and saw it. Right? Mm -hmm. Which was shocking. I was like, what? Because I was thinking, like, even if just people who are fans, like, if all the fans went, which would be, like, somewhere around 12 million people, you know, like, $15, $20 a ticket, like, on average, like, $15 on average, right? Mm. That's, 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 like, upwards of, like, $150 million. That would have cleared, that would have cleared their budget. They would have broke even just domestically. Um, but they didn't. They, like, barely got to, like, 20, I think, or 30 in the opening weekend, which was crazy to me. And, um... But they still made their money back because those Chinese audiences, they love this weird shit. They do watch movies like this. Like, like Chinese audiences don't want to play Halo, but they would go watch a Halo movie. You know? Hmm. So anyway, like I said, like, it's just, um, the difference is, is just, is just that. Uh, animation studios, which uh, none of you guys seem to have the style to kind of go in that direction, but I'll just kind of give you some a sense of that industry. It's it's, it's kind of like films and games, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of both. Like it has a kind of video game culture uh, when it comes to production, but then they um, but they make films, you know. So their pipeline is like very similar to like a film pipeline. Like they have like a lot of need for storyboard artists and concepting sets and stuff like that. And and it's a lot more contained and controlled the environments and the characters. Where uh, designing like a character in a video game, even if it's just like a novice or like a like a really simple NPC, you still have to design like everything. You know. Because like a player might see them from behind, where in a Pixar film you don't need to see the character from behind sometimes, so you don't need to design it. Hmm. And then you can just let the modeler figure that out. This is not that important. So you, the big difference, just to kind of wrap it all nicely in a bow, is just speed. Okay. Speed and quality. Good question. You guys are asking great questions, actually. Any other questions? The storyboarding, that would be a completely different thing, right? Yeah. It's not it's not a part of uh, concept art. No. Um no, something that's so close <laughs> something that's close to concept art that's similar to storyboarding as well as color keys. So like uh I've done this before many times where um 
they will have a scene that's already designed, it's already laid out, right? But they need like an idea of like the lighting and colors. And concept artists are usually good at this type of stuff. And so, so we, we were doing like a, a storyboard artist might not be good at lighting and color. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they, they will be able to tell story really effectively, but they just won't be able to, you know, uh, design uh, the lighting and stuff effectively. And so I tend to see concept artists do this pretty often. It's probably falls a bit more into um, environments. Not even like, like if you have a good understanding of environments, I think you're even better at it. But like, I, I'm not an environment artist, but yet I was successful doing it because I understand like, oh, okay, you know, like what complementary colors need to be there, like where lighting can be, and I just got to paint it in. Like I said, everything's already laid in, like the environment's already there and all that stuff. Like I don't have to design anything; I just design just the colors, you know. And it's it's not as challenging. So I'm getting at it's as like, fundamentals, I suppose. Yeah, it's just like a basic understanding of the overall fundamentals, and just applying it to a scene. Yeah, essentially. Um, but yeah, storyboards, uh, I've done them from time to time, but it is, you're, you're right. It's like a completely different discipline and I'm not really qualified to, I do okay. Cause I used to study stories, but I don't do it professionally. So I would say I'm okay at it, but I'm not great at it. Any other questions? Hello, uh, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so right now, um, I'm kind of in the position where so I'm finishing up uh, university, which is unrelated to art um and i've uh, me and my family are considering like we're kind of looking at two options one of them's for uh, education one of them is uh fcd school of design in singapore uh -huh. and another one is um kind of just getting like a visitor's visa and going to like la area looking at like um, brainstorm or go to LA area. Go to brainstorm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, could, I could be biased because I um, know John Park and James really well. They're really good friends of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also teaching. <laughs> Excuse me. I see. <laughs> I also taught at their LA campus, and I'm going to be one of their first instructors for the Inland Empire one that they just opened. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but like out of the people, out of all the people that I think are really good teachers, James and John are two of them, right? Especially John. Um, mm -hmm. We both taught at Red Engine, uh, a school a long time ago. And mm -hmm. I remember like just sitting in one of his classes and thinking, I said, man, this guy is like, really fucking smart, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, he's a super nice guy. And so they're really good about their curriculums and how they built it. It's, it's, it feels like a real, like, accredited school, even though you don't get any accreditation, right? Mm -hmm. um, the way that they set it up. Like, my, my, my school, or at least my mentorship, it's, it's just as it is, right? Just like kind of like a personal tutor type setup, you know? Mm -hmm. But theirs is like, yeah, the like class format. You have, like, you know, reviews. You have, like, a curriculum, you know? And so if you're looking to, like, have something, some, something like that, you know, a heavily accountable type of school system, right? Then, mm -hmm. then yeah, they're really good. 
Uh, I know Feng Zhu, uh, I know people who've taken this class, he's really fucking aggressive. And oh. that, that only works on people who can handle it, right? Like right. only, not everybody is like that. Like uh, I'm, I'm like that. Like I, I know if I were to sit in his classes, I would do great, right? Because I can take pretty harsh criticism pretty well. In fact, um, I, I've come to realize that most people can't. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that they're just a bunch of losers, okay? Like the way that I determine winners and losers is not by how much they can get shit on and take it, okay? Um, the way that I gauge uh, winners and losers is very much like the Rocky movie where he talks about how he's talking to his son because his son complains a lot. And then he was saying, he's like, you know, life is not about how hard you fight back because you will always lose. Life will beat the shit out of you essentially, right? But it's about keep going. It's about keep moving forward, even though you know you're losing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I usually separate the winners and losers is that. Like the difference I think really makes people who succeed versus those who don't succeed is not whether they can take feedback or whatever uh, really well or not. It's that they don't stop painting, okay? And sometimes someone coming down on you and telling you all this shit can actually mess up with your ego and insecurities and make you stop painting altogether. And, and if you were consistent before and just that one bad, you know, instance stopped you, I think that's bad. I think that's bad teaching, you know? Uh, and because I've done it myself, I had a couple students where I was really harsh with them. Uh, one student, I told her like, you know, she was really need to work on her materials. Her materials just really got awful. Mm -hmm. right and she didn't take it really well she was crying in my class and stuff um but i didn't even know like, this was like dark and she wrote like me a long email about like apologizing and stuff and i was like what the no i was just critiquing you like you didn't have to take it personal like i was just telling you how it is like i wasn't wrong but it hurt her feelings really badly and she just couldn't handle it and then i just yeah. never heard from her ever again but the problem is that she was really good like she's better than most of you guys right mm -hmm. Right, and that that's that's the part that hit me really, kind of hard. And then the second time it happened, same thing. It's just like I told this person in anatomy. She didn't cry. She just really confrontational, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I just had enough of it. And I was like, look, if you don't want to do this thing, then you're going to never succeed, you know. And I still feel that I what I said was right, right? Because basically, I was trying to tell her like her anatomy is really bad and it's going to take her forever to learn her anatomy unless she just actually studies it. And she's, I do, but I only study it whenever I'm in life drawing. And I'm like, well, that's, that's silly because that's like so hard to like go to life drawing all the time. Right. Yeah. And then I said, plus like, like there's actually even better re ways to learn anatomy outside of life drawing, like learning anatomy through books and stuff, like looking at the actual, like, you can't see the muscles underneath the skin, you know, mm -hmm. at life drawing. Like, like you really learn, and I even brought up with my own instructors, who's one of the best at life drawing. Like, he, that's what he does. Like, he studies, like, anatomy on, like, a medical level, right? And I was like, if you want to be a, a, you know, a competitive anatomy, like, character artist, then this is what you got to do. Otherwise, you're just never going to make it in this industry. So it'll take you forever. And she was just she was just not having it, and I just kind of said what I just said really harshly, came at her pretty hard, and then um, yeah, she dropped my class, and I, I never heard from her again. And again, she was another student in the class, probably the second best in the class, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. I think about like, I think that was bad teaching. I could have explained what I was explaining to them without hurting their feelings or without them being so confrontational, right? Um, there's ways to tell the, 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 to, to challenge people's insecurities without making them feel like shit or belittling them. I mean, they're going to feel a little bit of shit, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I think things you rolls that way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's unnecessary, like a really hard deadlines, mm -hmm. really like, uh, challenging type stuff, um, where I think brainstorm there's. A buffet of options of instructors and all that kind of stuff too mm -hmm. right and it's yeah. in the states near like the industry in which you probably want to work in like in Southern California there's right. a ton of studios you know right. and you'll make friends with people who will eventually probably work at these sort of studios which is a great network to make right? right yeah another thing I heard is like 
it kind of FCD kind of boasts that they give that student that their students have to work like eighteen hours a day. And no, that's not healthy, man. <laughs> kind teaching of like a bad habit. Yeah, it's teaching an incredibly bad habit. It's mm-hmm. teaching um, like work until you bleed. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a bad habit. Working that much is unhealthy. I think that there is a limit to how much you should work. Uh, I think it's between uh, it's between fifteen to thirty hours a week. So fifteen hours is like the minimum, right? This is mainly for those that don't have like a job. I don't know that. Let me say they do have a job. They have like a job or they have family. You know, they have they have a life, um, yeah. as you as you would say, right? Mm-hmm. And then the 30 hours is for people that are like, yeah, they don't have a job. They don't have a lot of responsibilities. That's a healthy, that's sustainable because what that will also let you do is let you go outside and see the world and hang out with people, get new experiences, right? That's really valuable and very healthy. You know, it gives you time to work out. It gives you time to make your own food and prepare, you know, Uh, sleep, you know, it allows you to enjoy your life on a larger scale versus mm-hmm. like waiting till you retire right okay. you know because yeah. what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow i guess you didn't have a chance to re- retire yeah. you know so why not enjoy life today why wait for it mm-hmm. and so you can totally accomplish your goals and live a life it's just the, the mentality of like work 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 has been trained in a lot of western cultures uh, and especially in Far East cultures, including mm-hmm. Singapore. And they have the highest rates of suicide. Oh, and they have the highest rates of depression and anxiety. Right? Right. Like, I remember I was debating somebody with, like, guns and stuff. You know, I'm starting to come around about my, my gun debate. I'm still pretty sure that Americans, we need to limit our gun access. But, like... Um, but ultimately, like, they were saying, well, you know, like, if you look at, like, Japan and Korea, they have, like, no guns. And they have just as much depression and suicide as we do. And so, so people are going to kill themselves regardless. And it's like, well, that's because it's a different issue, right? Yeah. Like, if they had access to guns, I almost assured it would be twice as much, right? It would be so much higher, you know? Because a lot of people... Um, they like, for instance, in uh, Korea, they do something like jump off the Han River, like jump into the Han River, like commit suicide mm-hmm. that way. But because like jumping into a river is an instant death, um, they have these people who like have like they basically suicide watch. They just drive around the, the the river back and forth, and they just save people who jump in. And there's like a lot of people, like they say, like hundreds of people a year. If those people could just go to the store, buy a gun, and just shoot themselves in the head, um, they would. Because the reason why people don't like to stab themselves to death or cut themselves to death or, you know, um, what you call it, what is another, like poison themselves, right? It's mm-hmm. because these things will hurt <laughs> a lot. And, um, and even, even so, what ends up happening is that people that do, let's say, try to stab themselves or try to overdose, there's a lot of conversion uh, because a lot of people who do end up doing that tend to turn around. Meaning that they they didn't die; they were unsuccessful, right? And now that they realized like how crazy it was to do so, right? They they change their mind usually. Not all. Some people still want to fucking kill themselves. You can't avoid that, right? But like what I'm trying to say is like there's an opportunity to turn around, and with uh, guns, there's no opportunity. It's a, it's a really effective weapon because that's what it's made for, and so. Um, you know, in Korea, Japan, there's like a lot of depression, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of suicide, okay? And they have really high standards um, within their culture, right, for success. And that's, I think, yeah. what leads to it. So you don't want to live that, like, yeah. you know. It's funny because, you know, uh, Harvard's being sued right now. I don't know if you heard about this. Because, um, like, apparently they've been, like, keeping Asian people at a very minimum. At least they've been trying to. But they're trying to like hide it through like a bunch of like kind of lingo and stuff. But ultimately, they're just being racist. Right? Like they're, they're just saying, oh, we're trying to get more diverse groups in here. You know, so we're canceling out or we're, we're denying people of a certain ethnic group because they just happen to be fucking kicking ass. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if that's like a, um, because it's true. Like a lot of these, like there was a kid who had like a 4.7 or some shit who got denied to go to Yale because of like, wow. they, they said personality reasons. And uh, he said that he saw some people that get in that had lower GPAs, much lower get in because um, I guess they had better personality. Like I can see how personality could contribute to someone's, you know, like access to a, getting a job. Right. But like, I don't get how that's the same for a university. Right. Like mm-hmm. this person wants to get smarter. Right. And you're saying, no, you can't come in because you, we don't like your personality. It's, I feel like it's a little bit backwards. And so, so they're, yeah, they're suing them right now. Right. There's an Asian correlations coalitions that are trying to sue them. And, uh, mm-hmm. but I don't know if that's like a, if that's a genetic thing found in far East cultures or far, far East genetics, or if that's just a cultural thing, like an environmental thing, right? It could, I think it's mostly environment, right? Because I know my mom was very much like that. Like, Anthony, you got to be doctor. <laughs> All right, whatever. <laughs> Seriously, she would always tell me I had to be a doctor or an engineer. I had to show her, like, my first few checks, my real, my first big job before she realized, like, oh, okay, this art thing's really fun. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I usually encourage people to stay away from high status, high standard type of thinking and education. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's unhealthy, and so yeah. I know they do that, and so that's why I usually try to get people a little bit more reference before they make their choice. Mm-hmm. Again, some people do really well in those circumstances and actually want that. You know, they they live for it. Right. I don't live for that, even though I would do well in that circumstance. I don't live for it, though. I don't really want to be in that circumstance. But if I'm put into like a really stressful circumstance, I'm really good at being uh, hand- handling stressful situations. Mm-hmm. Right? It's likely unsustainable. But it's just unsustainable. Yeah. Gotcha. I don't like okay. to put myself in these situations that I can survive them. And um, if I have a choice, I usually avoid them. Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, brainstorm, I would say, is better. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that they are any easier, like super easy or anything. Right. It's, it's, it's just less freaking crazy. And it's, yeah. it's, like, it's like you serve your own crazy. So I had some students who would like take three classes. That's fucking crazy, right? Um, then, then they make a really good point to tell you that like, hey, look, like each class is like a 15 to 20 hour work week. It's like a part-time job. So if you take three classes, it's like taking three part-time jobs. So it's like 60 hour plus, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to like treat it as a full-time gig, then maybe take two classes. Um, But if you want to really do really well, then take one class at a time per semester, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I had some students who took like one or two and they did the best. The ones who did three almost always dropped out. And I think Mm -hmm. it's because they overworked themselves. And... That's not smart. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. That helps a lot. Yeah. Um, again, I think California is better just because, again, there's a lot more opportunity. And, yeah. and it's less stress. And you'll, you'll get to hang out with people. And if you come, you'll be able to hang out with me. I'll be able to see you from time oh, to time. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, I have many students who took the mentorship that went to Brainstorm and love it. Uh, in fact, I um, before I taught at Brainstorm, like I, I was already supporting them. I was already encouraging their schools way before I even taught with there. Because, again, I was friends with John, and I mm-hmm. felt like he had a good school on his hands. So that's just how it is. All right. All right. All right, guys. I'm going to stop it here at the breaks. Great questions. Great class. You guys have a great weekend. Stay positive. Stay focused. Don't be strangers. Talk to each other. Help each other out. Stay focused uh, on your work and encourage each other. All right. With all that being said, peace out, friends. Talk to you later. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again. 
and I'll see you guys in my next videos.